everybody. We are back yet again uh, to do some kind of basic econometric discussion and stated tutorial. The topic today is how to deal with autocorrelated errors in a real simple time series regression context. Obviously, there's a lot more uh, to the story. Uh, we'll get into some of that uh, later on in additional videos when we do more sophisticated time series. Uh, but for our purposes today, we just want to look at a simple regression and then just take a look at the residuals and do some real basic tests for the presence of an autocorrelated error term. Okay, so here we go. We are going to take a look uh, today. So we're starting off with a blank uh, Stata file here. And we want to call up some monthly macro time series data for our example here. Uh, and we're going to use our Federal Reserve Economic Database as that, as that data source. Uh, so if you recall from one of the previous videos, uh, we can use that Fred use command. So Fred being our friend, uh, the Federal Reserve Economic Database. Uh, and as long as we know the code uh, that they use to represent the variables that we want, uh, we can do it everything right from Stata. Uh, generally, you'd have to go to the Fred website, look up the variables that you want so you know the right code to call up. Uh, we've done this enough now. Um, that we know to get the unemployment rate, for example, and monthly frequency, it's just unrate, all one word, U-N-R-A-T-E. Uh, and then a second variable here that we'll use as our X variable, again, just for example purposes, we're not doing any uh, sophisticated modeling here at all, uh, we're going to call up the monthly industrial production index, so INDPRO, and yes, it is case sensitive. So if we go ahead and hit enter, uh, we're going to call up those observations any any minute now there we are uh, so as you can see we've got 850 monthly observations uh, of unemployment rate almost 1200 observations of industrial production All right one next thing uh, we want to do here uh, is because we are going to be using some uh, kind of time series specific commands in stata so we need to tell stata uh, that we do have sequential time series observations uh, and which variable is going to order those. Uh, again, check out a previous video on how to deal with uh, the date variables, making them stata readable and human readable. Uh, we're going to just skip over that entirely right now and we're just going to generate a simple trend variable, so call it, uh, call it time, call it trend, call it t, whatever we want. Uh, we'll generate trend equal to underscore little n, and let's just take a look at what we have browsing our data here. So we have our text version of the date here, we have our uh, numerical version of the date, which we could format um, to be uh, stata readable as well, uh, and then we have that first observation of industrial production all the way back to 1919. Unemployment rate, as we saw, has fewer observations, it doesn't come into the sample here until 1948. We've got plenty of observations there, and then the variable we just created, our trend, starting at observation one, all the way till our most recent October 2018, uh, in my case when I'm making this video, uh, observation 1198. So we can close that out, uh, and then remember the next thing we have to do is tell Stata that that's going to be our, our sequential identifying variable. So TS set trend, and there we go. So again, for the purposes of our, our little discussion today, we're going to do a super simple regression, but imagine this is a regression that's actually a structural model that we really care about, uh, but we're not going to get into that right now. We're just going to simply run unemployment rate as a function of industrial production. In pro. So Y is our unemployment rate, X variable is our industrial production, and we hit enter, and again, wait for my, uh, my state to catch up. Uh, and we see we have 850 observations, so obviously uh, that data, a data set is only as strong as its weakest link, so we can only have the number of observations uh, over which both variables, all variables, coincide. And in this case, we get somewhat oddly, this kind of tells us we probably have a, a specification problem, a positive and significant coefficient on industrial production, so apparently as a industrial production goes up, that's associated with higher unemployment. We'd probably want to double check that as far as specification is concerned. I don't necessarily believe that. But again, for our purposes, let's take this as our regression model to uh, to look at. So again, what our concern is, 
is that the residuals generated from this regression are going to be correlated with one another, which is an indication that the true error term is also autocorrelated. So our first step is simply to, uh, to call the, uh, the residuals out from this regression. So we can use the predict command, and we'll call them u hat, right? Again, we can name it whatever we want, and then use that comma r comma resid um, comma residual option for predict again if we don't do that we'll get the y hat the comma r will give us our u hat so now we've generated a new variable in our data set here our, our u hat uh, and then the first step here is is the old eyeball test right just take a look at what those residuals are doing over time and see if we get that telltale clustering pattern of the residuals that would indicate a positive autocorrelation that we might expect. So a good place to start is just the uh, the time series line plot. So we see the TS line, and then the variable we want to plot versus time, uh, in this case time being our trend variable, is the U hat. Well, before we analyze the, hold on just a second. Before we analyze the actual content of the regression here, let me just do a quick uh, digression into uh, uh, into what that what the plot looks like. It looks pretty ugly, right? So we have all these missing observations here, and then for some reason the plot is looking for observations here, but there are none. So it would really be nice to generate this plot only over the observations that are used in estimation. And to clean it up a little bit, uh, we, again, if you go back to the previous video, we could uh, translate this trend into the date so we could actually see, well, what calendar date did observation 1000 or 500 actually represent? And we could locate uh, those different uh, sequences in time. I'm not going to worry about that right now. But a nice little trick here is that if we do that same command, TS line, U hat, if E sample, so E and then in parentheses sample equals equals one and let's also go comma y line parentheses zero All right. so let's see what this did for us okay so now it's the same plot but only over those observations that were actually used so we don't have any blank spaces there and then obviously that y line parentheses zero gives us this little reference point here so uh, that little E sample option uh, can come in handy a lot. Uh, so what that means is estimation sample. Uh, so uh, Stata kind of keeps a running tab of which observations are used in the most recently estimated model, and it, it, you can call that up, right? So this E sample is a kind of behind-the-scenes variable that takes on a value 1 for each observation if it was used in estimation 0 otherwise. So that's what we did. E sample equals equals 1 says, let's just look at the ones that were used. So, a much nicer plot, and we can see a real typical positive autocorrelation scenario. Right? Having that Y line zero tells us, yeah, half the observations are negative, half of them are positive, so we meet that criteria. By definition, OLS gives us a sample mean residual equal to zero. But we see this real strong clustering pattern, right? negative residuals clustered with negative residuals, positive residuals clustered with positive residuals, certainly not a random uh, outcome, which is what a residual, an error term, should be. So we have real strong visual evidence of positive autocorrelation here. The next step, of course, is to get some statistical evidence of positive autocorrelation. And the most basic way to approach this, uh, if you have a large enough sample, we could run a simple autoregressive of order one model with our residual. Right? So in this kind of uh, auxiliary or test equation, the residual itself is the dependent variable, and the independent variable is its own lag. So is today's residual a function of yesterday's residual? We already know that they are, but let's just take a look. So here we get a coefficient estimate of 0.99 T stat of 220, R squared of 98%, so obviously a strong, strong relationship between past and current residuals. Very strong evidence of, of autocorrelation here. And again, our theoretical model tells us that this 
coefficient here, that rho coefficient in an AR1 error term, right, that's representing our correlation coefficient between past and current residuals. So we definitely have an issue here. Uh, and in this case, that's probably as far as we would need to go to prove, right, that we need to, we need to address this issue. But the other kind of primary uh, test that you see in econometrics textbooks a lot uh, is that Durbin-Watson test. Um, and there's kind of a lot, a lot going on there, but we can look at it really simply. Um, and the first step is we need to call up that Durbin-Watson test statistic. And there is a command for that, but it's a post-estimation command in Stata, so that means it has to be called up directly following the regression that you want to test. So in other words, if I did it right now, I'd be testing my test equation for autocorrelation, and that's not what we want to do. We want to test my original structural model, which in this case was our unemployment as a function of industrial production. So let's re-estimate that model, and the command in question is estatdwatson. Okay. And it's not going to give us a whole lot of information here. Uh, most of the time in Stata, when you bring up a test statistic, uh, it gives you the real important uh, kind of companion information with that probability or the p-value, uh, the Durbin-Watson stat doesn't do that for us. Uh, and if you look into uh, the construction of the test and the underlying distribution, we kind of know why, right? It has that dual distribution problem. There's an upper distribution and a lower distribution. We never know exactly where our distribution is. We know it lies somewhere between there. So we have to do the the hard work, right? We have to go to the back of our econometrics book and bring up the Durbin-Watson critical table to make any sense out of this. Now, in this particular case, uh, we can all just eyeball it and know how this is going to work, right? So remember, if you have no autocorrelation, if that row term is equal to zero, your Durbin-Watson test statistic will be equal to two. If you have perfect positive autocorrelation, that Durbin-Watson stat is going to go to zero right, as rho goes to one. So this is clearly a lot closer to zero than it is to two, and it's going to be below any kind of reasonable critical, val critical value. But let's just take a look real quick at what we might find in our econometrics textbook. We go to the back of our book, and we'll might, we might see something like this. Right? So these are 5% critical values for the Durbin-Watson statistic at various levels of uh, K, right, which in most cases includes not just the number of slope coefficients estimated, but also the intercept, and that is the case here. So for our model, wherein we have uh, one X variable and an intercept K is going to be equal to two, and then along the, uh, the horizontal there, on that margin is in our sample size, which in our case is 850. Uh, this little table just goes up to a maximum of 100, so that's what we'll go ahead and use. So our relevant critical values are going to be the lower of 163, the upper of 1.72, uh, and we would have to be above 1.72 to not reject the null hypothesis, right? And the null hypothesis is rho equal to zero, no autocorrelation. So we can strongly reject that. Our value get all the way at 0.02, well below that critical, well into that tail, below the lower critical value. So we reject the null of no autocorrelation. Therefore, we conclude we do have significant positive autocorrelation. Okay. So now we know we have that problem. Obviously, the next step is how can we estimate this model with valid hypothesis testing results in the presence of an autocorrelated error. That'll be our next video. Come check it out, and we'll look at a few pretty basic ways of, of trying to solve this problem. So, thanks a lot. And uh, as always, uh, leave a comment if you have any questions. Uh, I'll try to get back to you uh, in that format as soon as possible. And thanks again for watching.